Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So good afternoon and welcome everyone um, to the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. My name is Kim Ricketts and I'm the manager of the series working with Kirsten Wiley of Microsoft Research to select and bring to campus big thinkers doing fascinating work on a variety of topics. Today's speaker is a perfect example of the kind of range that we bring. He actually embodies the range himself. <laughs> um, David Schenk is an award-winning, best-selling author of five books, including two on um, the emotional, social, and political ramifications of the information revolution. Data Smog, which we have over here today, which was published in 1997, was one of the first in, written and used as an indispensable, indispensable guide to the big picture of technology's cultural impact. He, it also prompted his co-founding of a movement called Technorealism, we can ask you about later, um, which has, encourages a balanced consideration of technology in our, in our current world. Then came the book, The End of Patience, also about technology. And then came The Forgetting, a book b called by many the definitive work on Alzheimer's, which was made into a PBS documentary on that subject. Along the way, David has advised the President's Council on Bioethics, written a column on business ethics for Spy Magazine, written about the emerging age of surveillance for National Geographic, and today he's here to discuss his latest book, The Immortal Game, A History of Chess or how 32 carved pieces on a board have eliminated our understanding of war, art, science, and the human brain. It's a story that travels across centuries and disciplines and seeks to answer some big questions. So please welcome David Schenk. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. I was actually last at Microsoft um, in 1997 talking about data smog. And I have to say it was probably my least receptive audience for that book. So. Um, I'm hoping it goes a little better today. Um, I didn't, they asked me then if I was going to do a PowerPoint. I got off to the wrong foot right away when I said no. I didn't even know what PowerPoint was. Um, and I'm not going to do one again today, although I now know how to do PowerPoint. Uh, I'm just going to talk and read a little bit from my book, and hopefully we'll take some questions and have some conversation. Um, so let me tell you where, how I got into this book a little bit. Um, I, as Kim said, I, uh, my last book was about Alzheimer's disease, so I've been writing and researching and talking about the brain now for a number of years. And one of the things you do when you, when you are living in the Alzheimer's world, when you're talking about that subject and talking to people about Alzheimer's, um, is you try to come up with positive things to say in a fairly bleak environment because there aren't really any very good drugs for Alzheimer's yet. We can't even slow it down. So the best we can tell people is, um, if you don't want to get Alzheimer's, is stay fit and keep your brain active. And for instance, uh, play chess. You know, play games that, uh, or any kind of, uh, get into any kind of intellectual activity that's going to really challenge your, your mind. Um, it doesn't have to be chess, but chess turns out to be a very, very uh, good thing to do because of its uh, virtually endless complexity. And uh, for those of you who play the game know that you could spend a lifetime playing and you never run out of, of challenges. You barely even, in fact, touch the tip of the iceberg of chess knowledge. So um, some, at some point along the way, in the last, um, I guess about four years ago, um, after saying play chess to you know, 150 audiences talking about Alzheimer's, I got curious about chess. And I really hadn't played that much myself. Um, but I wanted to, I mean, I knew how to play, but I wanted to kind of become reacquainted with the game and, and to learn a little bit about its history. And at the same time, I kind of ran across a couple of, a couple of, um, just by accident, a couple of um, stories about chess. There was actually a West Wing for the fans of West Wing where um, it actually, and now that I've seen the reruns, the chess is all over the West Wing in many episodes, but there was one in particular that kind of got my attention because they were using chess as a metaphor a geopolitical strategic metaphor. They were also talking about its ancient, uh, its ancient history, which I would have assumed goes back to medieval Europe, four or five hundred years, but actually is fifteen hundred years old. Um, and uh, and they also had these beautiful pieces, and and the the, the character uh, of the president, uh, played by Martin Sheen, is a gr actually a grandmaster, and he talks about the nuances of play, and and I was curious about that as well. So I started looking. 
so I'm, I'm giving Aaron Sorkin a lot of credit for this book, actually, um, as I have told him. And, um, and I started, I just wanted to know more about the history. And, and the more I, I dove into the history of chess, the more I was fascinated by the concept of a game being 1,500 years old and still thriving in the 21st century, a game that was invented in India and ancient Persia uh, by philosophers, presumably, and maybe by merchants, and was played by warriors, and um, yet is very prominent in 21st century urban schools. And I wanted to know how one game, uh, even though there have been a couple of changes over the years, it's still very, very similar uh, game to, to the one that was first invented all those years ago. I wanted to know how one game kind of transcended that, that uh, age. So um, the first thing I want to do, if you don't mind, is just read a couple of pages that get into that question a little bit, and then I'll go back to my more circuitous talking. Uh, so for those of you who have read the book or part of the book, the beginning of the introduction talks about a caliph uh, of the Abbasid Islamic Empire in the year 813 who was embroiled in the civil war in Baghdad, believe it or not, and um, essentially was losing this war and was within the day, um, it was pretty clear he was going to um, lose the war and get killed. And what's he doing inside all these walls? He's actually playing chess and he's much more interested in playing chess than paying attention to the battle that he's losing because he's winning the game of chess. So in this, I tell this whole story and uh, at the end of the story, he wins the game and gets beheaded uh, after he's captured. And I'll pick it up from there. Chess lived on. Um, the game had been a prominent court fixture of Caliph al-Amin's predecessor and would voraciously consume the attention of his, his successor. And the Caliph after that, and the Caliph after that. Several centuries before it infected feudal Christian Europe, Chess was already an indelible part of the landscape adjoining the Tigris and Euphrates. This simple game, imbued with a universe of complexity and character, demanded from peasants, soldiers, philosophers, and sovereigns an endless amount of time and energy. In return, it offered unique insights into the human endeavor. And so, against all odds, it lasted. Games, as a general rule, do not last. They come and go. In the 8th century, the Irish loved a board game called Fidgel. Long before that, in the third millennium BC, the Egyptians played a backgammon race game, a backgammon-like race game called Senate. The Romans were drawn to duodecim scripta, played with three knucklebone dice and stacks of discs. The Vikings were obsessed with a game called Hanafetafel, probably pronouncing that wrong, in the 10th century, in which a protagonist king attempted to escape through a ring of enemies to any edge of the board. The ancient Greeks had Petia and Cubia. These and hundreds of other once popular games are all, are all now long gone. They caught the public imagination of their time and place, and then for whatever reason lost steam. Generations died off, taking their habits with them, or conquering cultures imposed new ideas and pastimes. Or people just got bored and wanted something new. Many of the games fell into such total oblivion that they couldn't even make a coherent mark in the historical record. Try as they might, determined historians still cannot uncover the basic rules of play for a large graveyard of yesterday's games. Contrast this with chess, a game that could not be contained by religious edict, nor ocean, nor war, nor language barrier. Not even the merciless accumulation of time, which eventually washes over and dissolves most everything, could so much as tug lightly at chess's ferocious momentum. It has for numberless ages, wrote Benjamin Franklin in 1786, been the amusement of all the civilized nations of Asia, the Persians, the Indians, and the Chinese. Europe has had it above a thousand years. The Spaniards have spread it over their part of America, and it begins lately to make its appearance in these states. And I should say that um, although he, he missed a little bit on, on some of the dates, it's amazing what Benjamin Franklin knew about the history of chess, considering that, as far as I can tell, it really hadn't been very well cataloged in his day. So he, he gets a number of things kind of amazingly correct in that, in that statement. The game would eventually pass into every city in the world and along more than 1,500 years of continuous history, a common thread of pawn chains, knight forks, and humiliating checkmates that would run through the lives of, of Karl Marx. One second, let me just switch books here because I made a couple of notes in my copy. 
Car uh, run through the lives of Karl Marx, Elizabeth I, Pope Leo XIII, Arnold Schwarzenegger, King Edward I, George Bernard Shaw, Abraham Lincoln, Ivan the Terrible, Voltaire, King Montezuma, Rabbi Ibn Ezra, William the Conqueror, Jorge Luis Borges, Willie Nelson, Napoleon, Isabella of Castile, Samuel Beckett, Woody Allen, and Norman Schwarzkopf. And the list, as you probably can guess, could run hundreds of pages long. That, that could have been the whole book, just the list of, of famous players. From Baghdad's Golden Gate Palace to London's Windsor Castle to today's lakeside tables at Chicago's, Chicago's North Avenue Beach, chess would tie history together in a surprising and compelling way. How could a game last so long and appeal so broadly across vast spans of time, geography, language, and culture? Endurance is not, of course, a magnificent accomplishment in itself, but a compelling sign that something profound is going on, a catalytic connection between this quote-unquote game and the human brain. Another sign is that chess was not just played, but also integrated into the creative and professional lives of artists, linguists, psychologists, economists, mathematicians, politicians, theologians, computer scientists, and generals. It became a popular and pliable metaphor for abstract ideas and complex systems, and an effective tool through which scientists could better understand the human mind. Chess seemed to have been present in every place and time, and to have been utilized in every sort of activity. Kings cajoled and threatened with it, philosophers told stories with it, poets anal analogized with it, moralists preach with it. Its origins are wrapped up in some of the earliest discussions of fate versus free will. It sparked and settled feuds, facilitated and sabotaged romances, and fertilized literature from Dante to Nabokov. A 13th century book using chess as a guide to social morality may have been the second most popular text in the Middle Ages after the Bible. In the 20th century, chess enabled computer scientists to create intelligent machines, although we could debate that point here. Uh, chess has also in modern times been used to study memory, language, math, and logic, and has recently emerged as a powerful learning tool in elementary and secondary schools. The more I learned about chess's peculiarly strong cultural relevance in century after century, the more it seemed that chess's endurance was no historical accident. As with the Bible and Shakespeare, there was something particular about the game that made it continually accessible to generation after generation. It served a genuine function, perhaps not vital, but often far more than merely useful. I often found myself wondering how particular events or lives would have unfolded in chess's absence. A, condi a condition I learned that many chess haters had ardently sought. Perhaps the most vivid measure of chess's potency, in fact, is the determination of its orthodox enemies to stamp it out. As long ago as a ruling in 600, is 655 AD by Caliph Ali ben Abu Talib, the pref Prophet Muhammad's son-in-law, and as recently as decrees by Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini in 1981 and the Taliban in 1996, and the Iraqi clergy in post-Saddam Iraq. But like the Talmud, like the theory of natural selection, like any organized thought paradigm that humans have found irresistibly compelling, chess refused to go away. Why were 64 squares and a handful of generic war figurines such an indelible part of the human imagination? What was it about chess that drew simultaneous devotion and disgust and sparked so many powerful ideas and observations over many centuries? So that was essentially the question that I set out to answer. Um, and I think there are a number of answers. The, f the first one is that chess was really the first game of skill, of pure skill. Chess, as probably most of you know, has no chance in it at all. It's all reliant on, on, uh, on the mind. And this really sticks out from other games that were being played before it and even, uh, and even that were invented even after it that at least had some component of, of uh, skill, uh, of, of chance, um, as a part of the game. There's a wonderful text, ancient Persian text, that's all about chess, goes back over a thousand years, and there, there's a line in it that talks about how important, um, how important it is to rely on one's mind and, and the skills of one's mind. And there's a wonderful phrase that comes out of that, understanding is the essential weapon. Victory is obtained by the intellect. Um, now, these, aside from the kind of archaic nature, these phrases might go completely unnoticed in the 21st century where we all understand that we have to build up our minds and come up with 
be able to deal with, with complex concepts. But 1,500 years ago, that was a pretty new idea. And the, it was even newer that you could step away from relying on the fates and maybe have something to do, do with determining your own, uh, your own future. So um, chess is the first game of skill was really a, a big, uh, I think a big part of its allure early on and also arguably a turning point, part of a turning point for human civilization that, all of a sudden, that suddenly we were going to kind of think more in this direction towards determining our own future and, rely, and less in this direction of relying on gods and fates. Not that we obviously have completely come away from, from that side of, of our thinking, but still we have, we have made a lot of progress. Um, another thing that stands out about chess's history is that obviously this is war without bloodshed. That's, that's one of the famous uh, lines about it. Um, what is war without bloodshed? It's, it's competition. It's bloodless competition. Um, in, the old, in ancient times, chess was actually a way to settle disputes without fighting one another and killing one another. And when you think about it, um, bloodless competition turns out to be one of the foundations of the modern society that we live in. Capitalism, every, everything that we do in our lives is based on competing uh, to be better, to come up with better ideas, trying to beat the other guy in business or, or school or what have you, but to do it at the end of the day, you shake hands, it's all honorable, you don't knock them down, hopefully. Um, so the idea of competition substituting uh, bloodless competition for what used to be just kind of fierce battle on every front. But the most important thing that emerges from chess, even having made those two points, is, I think, is the dynamic between simplicity and complexity that takes place in the game. It's a, it's a fairly simple game to learn. A uh, six or seven year old who's determined to learn it can learn it in a few minutes time. Um, they teach it in schools now to, to second graders regularly all across the country. And yet, it has enough complexity within it that, as I mentioned, you can spend your whole life playing chess and never even really touch the tip of the iceberg of its possibilities. It turns out, that you might think that that's a slight exaggeration, but I'm going to back it up with some numbers now. It turns out that the number of distinct possible chess games playable, according to the people who figured this out, and I just have to trust them, is 10 to the 120th power. Put in, in uh, English, that is 1,000 trillion, 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 trillion distinct possible games. So um, this is not a number that any human being can obviously hope to attain in a lifetime of chess study. It's also not a number that any super powerful computer can crunch in any reasonable amount of time. We don't have actually computers around who can crunch through all the distinct possible chess games and come up with what we might call perfect chess knowledge. And I'm told the estimate is we're not going to have computers, although again this could be disputed here, that will be able to do that for, uh, for thousands of years. Um, the number is that big. To put 10 to the 120th power in, in a little bit of context, the number of estimated stars in our galaxy is 100 billion or 10 to the 11th power. The number of, sand, of grains of sand on the Earth is estimated to be between 10 to the 20th power or, uh, and 10 to the 24th power. And the number of electrons in the universe is estimated to be 10 to the 79th power. So um, in a very weird and um, frankly surreal turn of events. The, the chess has, is pregnant with more possibility than any of those, than any of those uh, other comparisons. Now, four things I think emerge from this dynamic of simplicity and complexity. Number one is, as I've already alluded to, it makes for a wonderful distraction from uh, what we might call real life. You can get lost in it. It's a whole universe unto itself. Uh, you can escape into it and never get tired of it. Um, in keeping with that, it's, it can be, as I've already said a couple times now, it can be a lifelong challenge. It can be something that you enjoy playing when you're 10, uh, learn a bit, little bit more when you're 15, get into more nuances, and on and on and on. You can be playing uh, through your life and, and be 90 years old and still, and still really be experiencing the uh, new uh, frontiers in, in the chess universe. Um, the third thing that I think emerges from, the, from this dynamic of simplicity and complexity 
is, as I've again already alluded to, is chess's power as a metaphor that helps us understand dynamic systems. So I mentioned uh, the text from medieval times, which is probably the best single example, where this uh, wonderful religious scholar wrote this giant text that helped people, at least people who could read at the time, understand their place in society. Um, chess is just removed enough from society for people to make it into a metaphor of whatever they want to. It's, you can make it into a metaphor of, of warfare, of battle. You can make it into a metaphor of, of social hierarchy. You can make it into a metaphor of any complex dynamic that you're trying to understand better. And um, this is also kind of goes to the foundation of, of modern society, where we actually need metaphors in order to think. Almost everything we do in, in our brains has to do with coming up with useful metaphors to help us uh, understand concepts. So chess is a, as a, as a, a pliable metaphor that has been used in all these different ways throughout the centuries, I think has also given it a lot of life. And, and finally, um, what emerges from this interesting dynamic is chess, very simply, as, uh, as an exercise machine for the brain. I'm going back to where I started now with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, because it turns out that chess is an extraordinary stairmaster of logical thought, of strategic thinking, of thinking ahead. Um, they've actually now done, in the last couple of decades, some studies on this. And they've backed up, in all sorts of ways, um, the, the usefulness of chess, not just for uh, people who are trying to extend their life and the life of their minds, but also for the very youngest among us. And in the last couple of years, chess has actually become integrated into, um, into school curricula, not just in, as an after-school activity, but actually having teachers taking school time to teach chess as a way for kids to get excited about thinking, as a way for them to be comfortable exploring this very complex world and maybe taking that idea, that notion of, of, of being in a somewhat chaotic world where you're making imperfect uh, decisions all the time and usually fairly quickly, and, and then taking that comfort to an outside world where we all, part of growing up and becoming intelligent, autonomous adults is being comfortable with symbolic thought, being co comfortable with logical thought, being comfortable with this extraordinary complexity in our world. Um, and the last two points I want to make before uh, we turn this hopefully into more of a conversation is um, that I think that that very last point is one of the two reasons why chess is going to survive for at least another 1,500 years, even in an age of incredible distraction and wonderfully thrilling movies and video games and, and stuff on the internet. I think this, uh, this idea of, um, of having the great escape of having a game that is both a distraction but also this kind of mind exercise machine is this great combination that's going to give it a lot more life. And number two, even though um, a lot of people these days are talking about chess and computers and a lot of people play computers uh, instead of playing real people, it's my personal belief and experience in the last couple of years of, of living in this world that chess is ultimately a game of human connection. It's a game where two six-year-olds can get together over a board or a or a seven-year-old and a 40-year-old parent, or a 10-year-old and an and a 85-year-old grandparent. Um, as long as they're not too dissimilar in skill, it's two human beings seeking a warmth and a connection with one another, also seeking to activate their minds, who come physically together in, in a, uh, across a board a foot, uh, two, two or three feet apart from one another. And whether they talk or not, sharing this, uh, this rather warm, if uh, extremely cerebral experience. So um, I think human connection is, is also uh, the future of chess, even though a, a lot of the attention of chess these days goes to computers. Um, so that's really the, those are some of my thoughts about chess. And I'd be happy to entertain questions about the actual history of the game and how it's changed, or any of those ideas, or anything else. Yes? Um. You know, it's a sort of a definitional uh, gray area. Has chess, is chess a 1,500-year-old game, or is it really just uh, so different in its history that it really didn't come into its own being until, I don't know, circa 1500, <laughs> they gave the bishop range of motion and all that. But 
but let's just say it's a 1,500, 200,000 year old game. So well, I'm, I'm sorry, let me rebut that point because I know that you're taking the opposite point. Um, for, for players who really play the game, obviously uh, some of the moves now are very different and make it a very different game. Um, a couple points for people who don't know this. It used to be the pawn could only move one space now um, and, and capture diagonally. Now it can move, at least in the first move, two spaces. Um, the rook has always had the same move. The knight has always had the same move. The, um, what we now call the bishop used to have a very different move. What we now call the queen um, used to be a lot less powerful and wasn't even called the queen. Um, so there, there are, have been a number of changes over the years, and I go into this in the book. There are lots of wonderful stories. I really think it's uh, very intellectually sound to argue that this is substantially the same game, and it, and it does have there is a thread through this. It's not as though this, is, this ancient uh, Persian game is one game and someone else invented a different game. This is the same game and it got tinkered with uh, a little bit through the years. But go ahead and make your second point. I'm happy to take that point of view because it, my question is, um, you know, if we sort of look, chess has been around so long, you almost have to look at it like in a geological time frame of mind. Right. It changes. But on the other hand, if we, if we just you know, look at today, we think, oh, well, chess is settled. It's the modern world. We don't change things anymore. Yeah. And chess is never going to change again. You know, we, I don't care that it's changed every 300 years. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's done. Yeah, right, sure. <laughs> so, um, uh, and since you have the, you know, the computer background too, it dives in. You know, the modern, powerful PC became available at home with chess software sometime in the 1990s, and at, the, at least at the grandmaster level, it has totally, it has had a tremendous effect on the game. A lot of people are saying, you know, gee, these opening, these games now are the same for the first 15, 18 years. Right. Something's not right here. Um, and so I personally have taken some interest in Chess 960 or Fisher Random Chess. I don't know if you've run across that. Basically, the only difference is the pieces don't have to start exactly in the same square. Um, and I'm just wondering whether you think that the modern world maybe does make it harder to ever change the rules. Are we under a tyranny of tradition here, or are we just waiting? Is it inevitable? Is, is the fact that computers have come along and had this effect actually going to accelerate the change, rate of change in the rules of chess? Very good. A very, very good question, I think, and hopefully not uh, above the interest of most of the people here. Um, and let me say, I mean, this could be an hour or many hours of discussion. My own personal, uh, I, I think that, that for, I like the phrase tyranny of tradition. Um, I think it also has obviously a lot to do with globalization and the fact that we're this, uh, for want of a better stereotype, this global village. And now it's interesting because Russia. Uh, I think mean, most people know that Russians have been playing chess for a long, long time. In fact, they got the game probably within 100 years after it was uh, first invented, if not sooner. Um, and yet they play our game now. They play the Western European uh, version of chess. In fact, I was just having a conversation with my barber, who is Russian, and uh, we were talking about the bishop, and he said, oh, you, the Sloan, which is the Russian word for elephant, which is what this piece was actually originally called. So they. They play our game, I say our game, they play the Western, you know, Christian version of the game, um, but they, um, they still use some of the ancient terminology. Um, I think that um, I'm not a serious enough chess player to feel stifled by all the, uh, the body of knowledge that uh, with a couple hundred years of study and with all this computer analysis we've now built, serious chess players have now built for themselves. I do really like the concept of Fisher Random Chess. The idea, uh, for, the, for those of you who don't know, is basically the same game of chess that we play now, but instead of the, the back uh, row pieces being always in the same order, you, you have some kind of randomizer that tells you what order to put them in for that particular game. Now, for people who don't play uh, much chess, it might seem like, well, what's the difference? Well, the difference is that that totally throws open um, it totally subverts the knowledge that all these serious players have built uh, over, over hundreds of years, that certain openings need to be a certain way or that they can be overcome by certain, uh, certain counterattacks. So um, I like the idea that it could kind of reduce a lot of the, not level the playing field entirely, but it could kind of, in a way, you know, freshen up the game. And um, it's interesting that it comes from Bobby Fischer, who in almost every other way is... Um, is not connected to reality, but I think this is actually a very, uh, and I talk about that in the book also, and I don't mean to make light of it, I think it's a very sad thing. Um, but I hope that begun, began to answer your question. Yes? But doesn't it introduce an element of chance into the game now? 
doesn't the Fisher random chess introduce an element of chance? No, because. Uh, how do you know that the sure. starting positions are fair for both the opponents? How do you know they're fair now? In fact, we know they're not fair. We know that white wins more than black. It's unfair. It's a flaw in chess that can be overcome, but that's what it is. Good answer. Uh, but I don't think it really introduces an element of chance into chess because once the game actually begins, you're still, yes, it, it, it sets up the, the game a little, it changes the rules a little differently, but you're still, it's still a game of skill uh, that an element of chance, but after that you are right, it was only a game of skill. That's right. That's how I see it. Oh, we've got to have more questions. Yes, or comments. Yes. The two players start with the same positions, right? In Fisher Random Chess? Yeah. I believe they do, yes. Yeah, otherwise, I think it would be kind of messed up. We could do a whole seminar on Fisher Random Chess. I just wouldn't be the one to lead it. Yes? My question, I know you wrote about this in the book, but can you talk a little bit about brain structure and chess and the kind of people that are interested in also a little bit, but you do talk about uh, mental illness and chess. Um, okay, two big topics. Um, let me just take mental illness first. One, um, I, I, I really wanted to understand there is this undeniable um, history that's really kind of, I think, a very s small sliver of chess, but, but uh, it was interesting to me, of all the, of, of this group of um, top, top players in the last, say, 100, 150 years who at a certain point were basically dominating the game I and mean, virtually unbeatable and then shortly thereafter veered into psychosis and really what we could call schizophrenia. Now, obviously these people to a person were not completely balanced before they started playing chess. They had unbalanced lives in all sorts of ways. But the thing I wanted to know, and the thing I'm still curious about, because I don't think I really have any definitive answers at all, is whether chess in some way can contribute to this idea of, of, of imbalance. And I, I am intrigued by, there are a bunch of ideas that I throw into this chapter. Um, one of them is, is the idea of people, obviously we're talking about people who are so serious about chess that they play and think about it virtually every waking moment. Um, and, um, and I also think that there's a, a plenty of people who do that and still are perfectly healthy emotionally and are not really uh, prey to, to uh, what these other people have suffered from. But if you look at the symptoms of, an, of, of this list of people, it's uncanny how, how each one of these people has kind of followed the same kind of pattern of paranoia and delusions and uh, have ended up either dying very early or been institutionalized in some way. Um, and to get into more detail than that, I think it would be a, a little bit um, inappropriate now, but it, it's something I do get into pretty deeply in the book. Um, what has chess taught us about the brain? Um, I'll, I'll share one quick story. Um, I don't think I mentioned, I may have mentioned, I've forgotten already, um, that one, um, another entry point for me in this book was that I actually had a great-great-grandfather whose name was Samuel Rosenthal, for any real chess historian nuts out there, um, who was really a, a very, very um, powerful chess player in France in the late 19th century. And I wanted to know more about him. And one of the things that he was involved in was a study by the famous, now famous psychologist Alfred Binet of a number of grandmasters in the 1890s. He, he brought in a bunch of grandmasters and he gave them a questionnaire and he watched them play chess. And he wanted to know what was it that made Grandmasters, Grandmasters. They actually weren't called Grandmasters then, but these top, top players. And he specifically wanted to know about memory. And there was a concept at the time, which actually still is very pervasive today as a myth, of, photograph, of photographic memory, of people, having these, uh, of, of people having very powerful memories that are based in these kind of snapshot-like thoughts, that they can see something visual and almost like blink their eyes and take a picture of it and remember it, you know, uh, 50 years later, uh, and, and also keep all these snapshots organized. And, and he th really thought that he was going to talk to all these grandmasters and watch them play, and he was going to explain this kind of visual memory. that He thought he was going to use chess to do that. Instead, he discovered an entirely new concept of memory and essentially uh, debunked this concept of visual memory. And he discovered that, that most of memory is actually based on pattern recognition. And it's a very abstract uh, phenomenon. Um, that, um, that has to do, it's more like uh, the way people experience music or, um, 
or, or uh, hear a sentence, whether or not you're kind of, it's a foreign language to you or it's a language you know, you, you're, it, it's not visual at all. And in fact, v visual, uh, trying to, to memorize uh, things visually and trying to recall uh, these, you know, these snapshots, the, the actual uh, visual representations of a game, as these top uh, players told the psychologist, was actually getting in the way. So um, it, it's funny, we, we talk about, uh, those of you, most of you probably heard of blindfold chess, where it, to us non-serious chess players, it seems amazing that someone can close their eyes and be told all the moves of their opponent and they can, they can envision the whole thing in their brain. It seems like they've got this amazing memory and they certainly do. Um, but, but actually blindfold chess is a way, as, as I've been told, that the really great chess players, they think that way anyway. And to stare at the board and the, and the texture of, of, of the board and the pieces and the color of the pieces, all, all that gets in their way because they're thinking abstractly and they're recognizing patterns the way we recognize uh, intuitively patterns in music and words and, and in other systems. And this observation actually set off uh, about a half century of investigation which led, believe it or not, to the formation of the field of cognitive science. Um, and there's a number of studies that I talk about in the book of how it went from Binet to this guy and to, the, to, this, to these other researchers. And it all started with this, with this study of um, actually my ancestor and, and a number of other uh, chess players. And there's a number of other cool things that you learn about the brain in here too. But that's kind of one really amazing part of chess and brain history that collided. Yes? A little bit about cognitive ability for Sure, please do. Um, most people think chess is about pattern recognition, and that's exactly what you just talked about. And the better you are at that, the better you are at chess. Yeah. But there's been a, a recent body of knowledge that's, that's, that's kind of come to light that says those pattern recognition abilities that the grandmasters have are specific to chess and don't apply beyond that game. So in, the, there's a concept of expert knowledge, and I wonder if you could comment about that. Yeah, I, I, I want to extend that because sure. I read an article a month or so ago, maybe you wrote it, where they put chess pieces in random orders yeah. and grandmasters could not remember a thing. But if you base it on a game, they, they recognize the patterns where they would remember, remember that. Well, I, I think a grandmaster would still kick my butt at chess even if you put them in random order. But no, I was saying memorizing, memorizing the positions. Memorizing the positions. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, okay, um, I'll take a stab at this. Um, this is another component of the game. I don't think that it actually subverts this whole idea of pattern recognition. I think that's, that's an important part of the game that doesn't just come from the current kind of configuration of the game. I think that there is, uh, and I'm not familiar with the study, I'll have to take a look at it, but I'd be surprised if randomizing chess entirely subverts this, this ability to form, to, to discern new patterns. But, that they randomized where the pieces were, not that right. they did the um, Fisher randomization. Right, I understand. Okay. Um, but, but having made the point about pattern recognition, there is another component of the game, which I actually didn't understand at all um, before I got into this uh, research project. I think I assumed, and a lot of new players assume when you come to the game f uh, fresh, you assume and you talk, we all, we, we novice chess players talk about chess as being able to see further ahead in the number of moves than, than the opposite player. And that's really what it's all about. So you move here and you think, well, if I move here, then that player is going to move here. Or maybe they'll move here. And then my response would be here, here, or here for that move, or here, here, here for that move. And it's the person who can think the extra move ahead that is somehow going to be the better chess player. And that is actually a part of chess. But um, a different part of chess, an equally maybe more important part of chess, is actually just understanding the, the, um, the essential elements of the game and the fact that there are um, strategic goals in chess, like fighting for the center of the board, which is kind of the most uh, important and famous one, that you have to understand. You can't just try to outfox your opponent, kind of move by move and think further ahead. There is a body of knowledge that you can accrue of which opening is better to, to attain this certain uh, tactical goal and then will lead to this kind of basic strategic um, um, initiative that will lead to this kind of end game. And there's a body of knowledge that, that uh, yes, serious chess players have accrued. We were talking about this a second ago, which computers have helped them 
uh, accrue, actually, and there's extraordinary amount of knowledge on computers, and every serious chess player now relies on a piece of software to look up uh, lines to see you know, where they go and see how they've been refuted by, by various players. Every serious game of chess, competitive game of chess, is now entered into this massive database, which I think has about three million games in it now. Um, so the interesting point to be made there, one interesting point to be made there, I think, is that in that sense, chess is, is this very nice analogy for, again, for, for modern society in that um, we are, all of us, uh, the product of not only our, uh, the ability of our brains to navigate complex systems, but also to, um, to use the knowledge that have been, has been accrued for us by our ancestors. So, for example, um, a doctor, a rather mediocre doctor, in, uh, or not even a doctor, say a first-year med student who's not even that smart or even that uh, aggressive, is going to know more about medicine probably in a couple months' time than some of the great doctors uh, of all time did, uh, say, 500 or 1,000 years ago, simply because knowledge has accrued and we just have it there at our fingertips. So that, also, that principle also applies in, uh, in chess. And I hope that kind of begins to answer your question. It also, you know, again, this could be a larger discussion. But. Question. But because we have to skew you off to an interview shortly, I'm not going to allow that this time. Ah. But I do want to invite everyone that has not signed up for the drawing for this chess set um, to make sure to put your card and your alias in there. We're going to draw that in a few minutes. You can certainly ask him questions um, while he's signing books for you or while we're sitting here, but we do have to get him out of here pretty soon. Yes? The radio. I heard something on the radio while I was driving. Yes. yes. You were at KUW this morning. I was. Yeah, talking to Megan Sukis. And then um, today you are at 3, I think. Uh, University Books Tonight. Oh, University Books Tonight at 7. Oh, yes. the, but the radio interview is with Rosemary Brockley and what's cable, cable TV. Please tell your non Microsoft friends that I'll be at University Bookstore tonight and hopefully we can bring uh, not only Big Crab, but also I, I strongly encourage. Uh, families to come and kids to come, and I do actually some more kid-friendly things when there, are, uh, when there are more kids here. Well, so. Jackson's here. Uh, I, I know there was one here, but um, so uh, thank you, thank, thank you very you much for coming. For I appreciate it. it.